This is still the season we call Easter Tide. We are still remembering resurrection right up until Pentecost later in May. And so my greeting to you remains Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And thank you for the wade in the water. That was beautiful. I saw the, the kids grooving. The kids were definitely moving. I hope you were too. So um, thank you guys. Good, good leadership in the church. Good morning and welcome to First Church of Christ in Simsbury. I am Pastor George Harris. A joy to welcome any and all of you to worship, whether you're worshiping at home, online, or here in person. I'm joined, as I uh, so often am, by my beloved colleague, Rev Kev, by the maestro, Mark Mercier, Jim Martoccio, Jonathan on the sound and the visuals, uh, Ardell McGee, our facilities manager, always makes this all possible as well. Our ushers, our choir, and most of all, all of you, because without you, we cannot properly worship God. So again, welcome. For those who might be visiting uh, for a first time or a second time, I would just remind you that we are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ, and 
I won't go into detail about what that might mean, but it means we seek to be intentional in our welcome of all people, to meet you where you are, and to recognize you as a magnificent creation of the divine. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. So, I have a joke if I can remember it. <laughs> so some of you know that two weeks ago, we had turkeys at our door. Last week, we had bears in our trees. So this is a joke about bunnies. And this is about bunnies that had infested churches in one town. Bunnies everywhere, and the churches took three approaches to those bunnies. One church sought to pray them away. That failed miserably. The bunnies just continued to multiply. Imagine our sanctuary filled with bunnies. That's the, that's the image here. Another church said, well, we can't hurt God's creatures, so they sought to capture all the bunnies and take them out of town. But sure enough, the bunnies found their way back and again just filled the sanctuary. The third church had a different idea. They said, okay, we're going to baptize the bunnies and make them members. <laughs> and we'll only see them on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and that worked. That worked. <laughs> Kevin and I can tell you that works. But thank you for being the exception to that. Thank you for being here on this Sunday morning. Let us be together in prayer. God, you are the source of our life. Gather us now, we pray. Form us into a holy community of your own people, molding us by the breath of your Holy Spirit and revealing in us your body, the church, the face of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, children. How are we this morning? Doing well? All right. Well, I want to talk with you this morning about friendship, okay? And I have here um, some questions. Uh, I have some treats in the bag or some, some goodies in the bag to, to talk about, but I have some, uh, some questions first. When it comes to friends, where do you have friends? Do you have friends? Let's name some places where, you're, where your friends hang out and you hang out with your friends. Yeah. School, where else? Yeah. Play dates, yeah. Mm -hmm. Say it again, please. Soccer, so yeah, soccer or sports. Nick? Parties. Parties, yep, uh huh. Yeah, and church too, right? Neighbors, yeah, all, all kinds of places. Now, I have in here. Um, something that's pretty common. Now, all of this is closed, all right, so to, to make sure that uh, everything's safe here. But we have, we have some bread, okay? If you're hungry, hungry for lunch later, we have, we have bread. And we also have jelly, right? Now, um, some of you might like to make a jelly sandwich, right? And that's good, right? Jelly and bread together are good. Some of you might like to make just a peanut butter sandwich, because peanut butter and bread are good, right? But have you ever put peanut butter and jelly together on a piece of bread? Yeah? Uh-huh. So how does the jelly taste? Good. Well, it tastes good, but like kind of like what is it sweet? Uh-huh. Yeah. It's a little wet, right? How how does the peanut butter taste? Creamy. Creamy? Uh-huh. And sticky? Yeah, so 
you know, it's a little bit sometimes like friends. We have friends, like we just eat jelly on the bread. We have friends that are just like us, right? The same interests, they like the same sports, the same music. We laugh at the same things, right? It would be like just putting jelly on the bread or just putting peanut butter on the bread. But sometimes we find friends that we have some things in common, maybe a lot of things in common, but there are also differences, right? Maybe interested in different sports or interested in different kinds of music, right? Doing different things. And sometimes when we hang out with those friends, we realize that we can really grow and expand our horizons. So Pastor George here, we, we work together, but we're also friends. He likes ice hockey, yeah? And he talks to me about ice hockey, and I nod my head, and I say, yeah, that's great, <laughs> right? I like baseball, yeah? And he knows a lot about baseball, but he nods his head. He says, Kevin, that was great. That was great, right? But it's kind of cool because we get to share experiences and, and know, and I know how the Bruins are doing it. They're in the playoffs, I think. No? Yes, they are. Yeah, game seven tonight. Yes, yes. So, so we keep each other posted, and we can grow together and learn new things. And that's the beautiful thing because God makes each of us unique and different. Some of us are like jelly. Some of us are like peanut butter. When we come together, right, we come together and we learn from one another, God can make amazing things happen. So I ask you and challenge you in church school today to make sure that you reach out to someone new. See if you can make a new friend today and keep your old friends too. Now what we're going to do, we're going to stand up and we're going to say together our call to worship the whole congregation and then you'll head off to church school. Go ahead, Jack, lead us. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, if you lift your net and it is empty, come here. Cast it out and again into Christ's abundance. If you open your eyes but do not recognize the Holy One, come here. We'll find the risen Christ in my eyes. If your life is filled with mourning, come here. Christ is leading a dance of joy. Come here, sisters and brothers. Church school, okay? Go to church school? Yeah. be seated. Thank you.
Day by day, God would lead us to the places of hope and of healing, while moment by moment, we continue to follow down wrong paths. Let us confess our lives as we draw near to the one who would restore us to wholeness, praying together, Lord, save us from ourselves. We continue to do the same things over and over, expecting different results. Lord, save us from doing too much. We go fishing every day, not noticing you waiting with a meal on the beach. Lord, save us from doing too little. We say we love you, and yet so often we neglect your sheep. Lord, save us from ourselves. Help us to hear and respond when you say, follow me. This we know for certain we are forgiven by our gracious God. This good news never ceases to astound us. This promise is passed on to us so we may share it with everyone we meet. For this news we give thanks to God. Amen.
Our scripture reading comes from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had taken it off and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. On Friday evening, my wife Lourdes and I went on a date to the Crown and Hammer pub in Collinsville. We sat at the bar and enjoyed a couple beers and a light meal. Now the Crown and Hammer attracts a local crowd. Most of the people who sat around us lived in Collinsville and many of them had walked to the pub. 
The customers and the staff were completely without pretense and happy chatter filled the air. I began as I often do by asking the bartender here named Nikki what IPAs they had on tap. For the uninitiated, an IPA is an India Pale Ale, a type of beer that has a distinctive bite created by the use of hops. Though IPAs are an acquired taste for some, I have come to love them, and this time chose one that Nikki re recommended called Fuzzy Baby Ducks. That's right, Fuzzy Baby Ducks. IPAs are also known for their creative names. And in the way a sommelier offers a detailed, nuanced description of a wine, so beer enthusiasts have their own language for beer. Here is a review of Fuzzy Baby Ducks by Russ from Arkansas, describing its looks. Pours a hazed honey color with one finger of cream colored head. Pretty good head retention, okay lacing. Don't know what lacing is. Smell, grassiness and citrus. Russ says he expected more nose. The taste follows the nose, some lime, sweet breadiness, mango, and a kiss of pineapple up front. Green melons, a little dryness, grassiness, lime, and a little tangerine as the beer warms. Finishes a little grassy and dry with green melon and a kiss of pineapple. Still not done. The feel, medium body, pretty lively carbonation, good balance. Russ concludes, super drinkability. I feel like this would have knocked my socks off 10 years ago, still solid. <clears throat> I guess Russ has matured over those 10 years. <laughs> Having finished my fuzzy baby duck, I was prepared to order another IPA. But we had been talking to a couple guys sitting next to us. These were Collinsville natives, elementary school classmates, both age 27. I know because they told their age a bit defensively after Lourdes made a couple jokes about how young they looked. One was an elementary school custodian and played in a band, Moon Matrix of the Lizard People. I'll call them Garth and Wayne because they remind me of the characters in the movie Wayne's World. Garth and Wayne were not drinking a beer with a hint of lime, sweet breadiness, mango, and a kiss of pineapple, no. Wayne and Garth were drinking Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, also known as PBR. I don't expect I need to explain Pabst to most of you. It's an American classic that has been brewed by Pabst Brewing Company since 1844. Often dismissed as cheap and tasteless, it has uh, more recently experienced a resurgence. So what the heck, I thought, and told Nikki, I'll have what they're having. So I shared on Facebook that I had enjoyed my first PBR, and here are some of the reviews from my friends. There were some snarky comments, like our own Chris Barnett, who said, hopefully your last, with a laughing emoji. <laughs> but PBR had its defenders. A retired Marine buddy of mine, Mike, said, you know it's good, because it won a blue ribbon. <laughs> our own Kirk Scully, Ah, a favorite amongst the ski bums of the world. Our own Don Medvey, nice and cold, not bad. And an old friend, Tom, up in Norfolk, Connecticut, a classic brew, tastes like high school. <laughs> tastes like high school, that about sums it up. In high school, my taste for beer tended toward less is more, the less taste, the better. And when I took a sip of PBR on Friday, well, I loved it. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave you on the edge of your seats, wondering what the heck this has to do with the story we heard Jack read about Jesus being revealed to the disciples as they were fishing. But connecting the dots will first require a little bit of Bible study. So let me draw some attention to some things about where this story is situated in John's Gospel. A couple weeks ago, I preached about so-called Doubting Thomas, suggesting that we might take a more sympathetic view of Thomas's desire to see and touch 
Jesus to experience the resurrection for himself. I suggested that we might affirm him as curious Thomas rather than dismissing him as doubtful. That passage about Thomas in the 20th chapter of John ends with these words. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Now doesn't that sound like the ending to John's Gospel? Yet there is a chapter 21 that begins as Jack read. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. And we heard the story unfold. It's an entirely different story of the resurrection. Really, it couldn't be more different. And honestly, it doesn't seem to fit. It takes place not in Jerusalem, where the disciples had cowered in fear, afraid that those whom had killed Jesus would come after them as well, but by the Sea of Tiberias, 75 miles away from Jerusalem. And instead of three days after Jesus died, today's story takes place some period of time later. The disciples had gone back to their lives, the lives they had before meeting Jesus, working as fishermen. Does this make any sense at all? When the resurrected Jesus appeared to the disciples three days after his death, they were said to have recognized him and believed. Thomas himself said, my Lord and my God. How can we make sense of the fact that the disciples appear to have gone back to their former lives, apparently giving up on the restoration and renewal that Jesus had promised? Months, maybe even years later, they cast their nets with no apparent knowledge that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, some scholars suggest a couple things here. First, that this 21st chapter may have been added to the Gospel of John by a later author, and that it may even reflect an older story that had circulated about Jesus' resurrection. The late Bible scholar Bishop John Shelby Spong goes so far as to suggest that this story of Jesus appearing to the disciples after they had gone back to their former lives may reflect a more factual account of what actually happened. Could this be a window into the actual experience that changed the disciples' lives, changed the course of history? If this is the case, the disciples had given up and gone home to Galilee. If there was any talk of Jesus among them, it was likely only how much they had been disappointed by his death and the death of the dream for a better world he had spun for them. In this scene, they are past waiting, past hoping for anything. They had gone back to trying to make a living in the workaday world. The way things are is the way they will always be. Let's just make the best of a bad situation. And then this happened. A stranger on the shore, unrecognizable from a distance of a hundred yards, calls out to them from the beach, suggesting that they cast their nets on the other side of their boat, where they catch 153 large fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved, understood to be John, proclaims, it is the Lord. When they get to shore, Jesus has prepared breakfast for them, a simple meal of bread and fish. Now, as in other accounts of the resurrection, Jesus at first is not recognized by the disciples, which raises any number of questions. Had Jesus' appearance changed? Or was Jesus made manifest in another? A gardener at the tomb, a stranger on the road to Emmaus, or here on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias? Now, I don't know how much all of you know this, but we have a very wise and thoughtful theologian among us here at First Church, Mark Mercier. I am often struck by the profound insights Mark offers. So here, this is from the May issue of our church newsletter, The Cornerstone, that just came out on Friday. I have made a 
few very minor edits so it fits here. Mark writes, here's the deal. We gather for worship because something extraordinary happened 2,000 years ago. Something timeless, something life-changing, something that caused people to see and experience something that reverberates down to the present time. Resurrection is not seeing different things in the same old way. Resurrection is seeing the same things in a different way. Not with the eyes or the ears, but a mind that actually understands. A heart that is big enough to see the love that is everywhere. A soul that is the size of the world and everything in it. This must have been, in some way, the experience the disciples had. They didn't just see a ghost. People, the gardener and the companion on the road, or the stranger by the sea, didn't just morph into Christ like some sort of special effect. These disciples saw that these people were Christ, a presence so close to their hearts that they have almost known him forever. Look with different eyes. See with larger hearts. The gardener didn't change, Mary did. The stranger on the road became familiar when the disciples' eyes were opened. And here I would add, the disciples came to see Jesus in the one who cooks them breakfast. Not a gourmet meal, not eggs benedict, just bread and fish. This was a PBR breakfast. In fact, did you know there is a diner in Chicago that serves something called a PBR breakfast? Another friend on Facebook turned me on to this. Here it is from the Longman an eagle. That is not Photoshop. That is a real breakfast from the Longman and Eagle in Chicago. You can take it down. <laughs> I suggest that a few things happen that prevent us from recognizing resurrection when it's right in front of us. Like the disciples, when our hopes are disappointed, we too quickly give up forget the dreams we once had for ourselves and the world, keep our heads down and go back to our workaday lives. We risk becoming cynical and embittered. With eyes cast downward, we might miss resurrection manifesting itself right in front of us. We are looking for the angels dressed in white and miss the simple meal of bread and fish prepared by a stranger. We are looking for the perfect IPA fuzzy baby ducks maybe, and we miss that resurrection is just as likely to be found with an ice-cold Pabst. After all, it won a blue ribbon. Don't get me wrong, I still love IPAs, but whether in beer or resurrection, we can't let our expectations for that transcendent moment, that moment of perfection, take our attention from what is unfolding right in front of us. Resurrection is not a singular experience, but happens whenever and wherever people gather. The pulse of life at the lakeside was not in the bread or the fish, nor was it at the crown and hammer on Friday in the IPA or the PBR, but in the relationships in these places. Now, many of you know that Lourdes and I have had a rough couple years, and I know we are not alone. Many of you here this morning are experiencing your own trials. No angels dressed in white appeared on Friday night, but with Wayne and Garth and Nikki the bartender, we had a good date. We had a good date. I might even venture that we experienced a PBR resurrection, simple, life-giving, enjoyed with others. Mark offers what he calls a bit of a clincher, and I close with this. In his reflection on resurrection, he says, we can ask for seeing eyes and bigger hearts, and we can get them. Try it. It happens. Amen.
come to the time in our worship where we share together our celebrations and our concerns uh, for one another, for our world. Uh, we begin uh, by celebrating with uh, Corliss Moralda. Uh, Corliss, understand birth of a new grandchild, uh, Oliver, and you have two other uh, grandsons with you, so congratulations to you and your family today. Uh, we celebrate with seminarian uh, Megan Strauss. Uh, Megan has been accepted into a two-year pastoral residency program, residency program at a Wellesley Village Church. Um, it's a wonderful uh, program. She'll be there uh, for two full years, and we wish her well. We send her with blessings and prayers. Uh, we pray for the Petron family on the passing of Chris's mother, uh, Elaine Petron. We keep Chris, Jen, Zach, and Olivia in our prayers. For Sandy Christensen, she has uh, moved to McLean. She has been on our prayer list uh, in hospice for a long, long time. Uh, she's moving to McLean, and so we pray for her. We also pray for her husband, Ted, as he prepares to live alone. For our church and community, uh, we pray for uh, those in our country fearful as their states make sweeping laws uh, removing access to care, services, and rights. And this morning's flowers uh, are given by Kelsey Beach in loving memory of her mother, Janet Gray. So I invite you now to take a moment to pray over uh, our prayer list. You can see the names and let us be together in silent prayer. And then I'll ask what additional names are on your hearts today. other names you'd like to share aloud. Sarah. For your mom, uh, for healing, and for Pastor Dan. Jen. Mm. Prayers for, for Zoe, who has a difficult diagnosis for her family, for her parents. Thank you. Other prayers. Well, the Lord be with you. Loving God, as we do each week, we lift our prayers, those printed, those spoken aloud, prayers for each other, prayers for our community and beyond. We trust that you hear them and hold them. And God, this morning, we gather giving thanks for all of your gifts, for daily food, for health, for each breath we take, for the gifts of your word, the power of your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider how you have entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us, God, as followers of Jesus, to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word, perhaps even if it be misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whom others might think only worthy of hate, to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us be faith-filled, desire to increase your glory and your goodness in this world. Make us people who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. We pray for our church gathered today, the church both here and around the world, 
that it may encourage all of its members to discover, develop, and use gifts to nurture, to be graceful, to be understanding. We pray for those who are poor in body or in spirit, for those oppressed, and for those who are sick or in despair. Be present with all of those for whom we have prayed. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And now I will call forward Elaine Meek, who has a mission moment to share. Uh, tonight, JF and PF, that's our junior high group, 6th through 8th grade, and our high school group, 9th through 12th grade, will be going bowling at spare time in Windsor. We'll meet here at 6 p.m. So we'll be bowling, pizza, and some arcades tonight, a fun night out. Uh, if you have questions about that, you can see me after worship. Um, the Board of Music Ministries will be presenting a evening of jazz on Friday. Uh, May 12th, they'll be in Palmer Hall. Uh, Matt D. Champlain, a well-known jazz pianist, will be performing at 7.30 um, with two sets, um, and it'll be set up downstairs in Palmer Hall, uh, cabaret style, with tables and refreshments for all. Elaine. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Journey Home is a nonprofit organization that leads the effort to end homelessness in the Hartford area. This team of innovative problem solvers are passionate about ending homelessness. First Church supports this organization through our mission and outreach initiatives. It is also a top priority of GIA. In addition to monetary support, we can help in a very hands-on way. It's time for spring cleaning, everybody. And on Sunday, May the 7th, next Sunday, we're having an all-church donation day for Journey Home. The clients moving into apartments in our Hartford area need our help. They need new and lightly used furniture, linens, kitchenware, gas cards, and gift cards. The apartments are small, so the needs are very specific. Um, on the website, there contain lists of those things that we need for this particular initiative. Um, please bring your donations to church on Sunday, May 7th, and we'll collect them in Palmer Hall uh, before and after church. Journey Home is going to send a truck, and we're going to, uh, they're going to accept all our donations. Um, I know that we all have stuff. When I opened my drawer this morning, my kitchen drawer, it was kind of tough to open. I looked in there, and gee, there were four slotted spoons. Well, nobody really needs four slotted spoons, so some of them went into my donation pile. So I hope that you, too, will take a look this week at some of the things that you might have that are needed for our homeless people downtown in Hartford. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. In response uh, to the ministries of this church and God's 
uh, great gifts of, of love and care for all people. Let us now give of our gifts and our offerings. <clears throat> Please receive these, our gifts, in the humble spirit in which we offer them, that we might be a church and that we might be a people of resurrection in big and small ways. We offer these in the name of your Son, the risen Christ. Amen.
me offer two brief things before I pray us out. Uh, first, um, perhaps you know, perhaps you don't, um, for six weeks, and we're two weeks into it, so there's four more weeks during which I'm offering our Zoom Bible study in the evenings at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evenings with the hope that more folks might be able to participate than would at the 10 o'clock in the morning time. Um, we have a few more people, but I would love to see uh, more of you there. Uh, we, we, we study the, the text that we're going to be preaching on on Sunday, so it's a way of getting a little sort of uh, input or familiarization with those scripture passages. So please check it out. The, the Zoom link is in the weekly email that we send out. Also, um, just, just something for you to ponder. It came up at Bible study, the idea that we might do something for four to six weeks where we all commit to praying at home or wherever we are at the same time every week, the same prayer, um, just as a practice, as a spiritual practice. And there was talk of what that prayer might be, maybe the Lord's Prayer, some suggested. And that made me think that we don't often memorize stuff in the church anymore, do we? I mean, I think the Lord's Prayer, for many of us, that's it, the Lord's Prayer. And I can't say that I've memorized a whole lot more. I've memorized the Lord's Prayer, I've memorized the 23rd Psalm, and I've memorized the benediction that I share every Sunday. And then it occurred to me, I am clear that the favorite part of the service for many, beyond the music, is the benediction. Not because it's just the end, but because, you really, but because you really like the benediction. So think about that. Think if we might sort of commit to like a six-week spiritual practice together where we all say that at 5 o'clock every evening we're all going to say aloud where we are. Maybe kneel. Maybe we'll even commit to kneel and say the benediction aloud together wherever we are. Kind of a cool thought, I think. So with that, may the spirit of the living God made known most fully to you in Jesus Christ. Go before you to show you the way. Go above you to watch over you. Go behind you to nudge you into places you might not go by yourselves. Go beneath you to uphold and uplift you. And go beside you to be your strong and constant companion. And dwell within you that you may know that you are never, ever alone. And that you are loved, loved beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always. Amen. Amen.